Hey, Westside Dan Sutherland here to introduce week two of What If the Church. Last week we started our series called Called with the idea that God has called us to look up in prayer. This week, Troy McMahon, the pastor of Restore Community Church up near the airport, is going to be teaching us on the idea of we are called to be different. The, the basic idea in the teaching is you can't make a difference in this world until you are different from the world. Troy is a great friend. You're going to love him. He was with us a couple of years ago during What If. I'm actually speaking at his place today because part of What If is that we swap pastors, we serve together, we worship together, we pray together. You're going to enjoy my friend, Troy McMahon. God bless. Uh, good morning, Westside. Thank you. It is great to be here this morning. I want to give a special shout out to the folks that are over in the venue. I got to worship with them for the first song this morning. Great, great expansion that God is doing here. Also to those who are online and the guys up at Lansing. Thanks for inviting me to come and be a part of Westside family this weekend. You know, over the last couple of years, it has been a joy and a pleasure for me to get to hang out with your pastor, Dan Sutherland. And he has become a very close friend. We have walked alongside and done life together. We've experienced some high highs. And we've walked through some low lows together. So I first want to kick off this morning and just say thank you. Thank you to all of you here for bringing Dan and Mary Sutherland to Kansas City. Not just because of all the God things that are happening through them, but the fact that in my life, Dan speaks truth. And he is helping me to become the man that God has in mind for me to be. So I am grateful to you. Thank you so very much for doing that, not just for Kansas City, but for me personally. It has been a couple years since I got the chance to speak here at Westside, and I gotta tell you, God's up to some cool things. What's happened as a result of what if the church is bigger than just these three weeks. It was two years ago, 2009, when Restore Community Church, a brand new church up in the Northland, partnered with Westside Family and Olathe Bible Church to do What If the Church is Our Triad. And, and we shared our speaking engagement at each of our churches, and then we came together and we prayed together and we served together and we worshiped together with other churches. And I'll tell you, it was an awesome experience. But what came out of that was some relationships. Some relationships that, that created a dream is Mike Bickley from Olathe Bible and Dan from here at Westside and myself. We said, what could God do with this relationship that would even have a greater impact for the gospel? So what came out of that was, what if? What if we helped plant a church together? A church that would reach people who are far from God. A church that would help people experience what it means to have a transform eternity through Jesus. Well, it was just a dream, but that dream is now coming to fruition. As a matter of fact, this fall over in Shawnee, there's going to be a brand new church started that began two years ago with just a dream. That's New City Church, and that's led by Matt Miller. And Matt's going to be here speaking next week uh, as part of what of the church. And I know that Matt's been hanging out with you here at Westside for the past couple of months, and, and we had the chance to have him at Restore for the previous nine months, and I am excited of what God is doing in and through Matt's leadership. He is a gifted leader and a great communicator. So I am excited that we are partnering together, three churches from three denominations coming together to plant a church. What if the church is indeed changing the spiritual landscape of Kansas City? Now, before we dive in our topic this morning, I thought since we're friends, right? When friends get together, what do you do? You talk about your family. Oh, I gotta catch you up to speed on the McMahon family. Now, I'm married to my wife, Janet. Dan constantly reminds me that in this regard to my wife, I have outkicked my coverage, okay? <laughs> I would agree. We will be married 25 years this fall. And I, yeah, I'm telling you, and I'm excited about that. We got three kids. We got my oldest son, Jake, he's 20. Got a son, Mitch, who's 17. And then we got my princess, Judy Ann, she's 11. Now, last time I was here, I shared with you, we have a problem in our family. It's a fanhood problem. Now, I graduated from that excellent institution of higher learning in Manhattan, Kansas. Okay? Yeah. The Kansas State University of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. K-State for short. My wife, well, she graduated from that other university in Kansas. Okay? Enough said. 
Well, our two oldest sons decided they would split their fanhood. My oldest son would pick KU. He's a basketball fan. My younger son would pick K-State. He's a football fan. And so we had this teeter-totter throughout. My daughter comes along, and two years ago, I shared with you, she had made a decision. <laughs> I'm telling you, we have pushed on her and pushed on her, but she will not relinquish that Mizzou fanhood. Oh, it's killing me. Killing me dead. I think that's worse than KU. Oh. But anyway, um, so pray for us. We need your prayers. <laughs> Enough about me. Let's talk about you. Well, actually, let's talk about us. Last week, we kicked off this series here called Called. So if you do, would help me out, grab your message notes, wave them at me, make sure you've got them. All right? And Dan introduced you to the Greek word for church. You remember that word? Ekklesia. And that actually means the called out ones. So that you and I, as the church, we are called, and we are indeed called to stand out. So if you're a note taker, go ahead and fill in your first two blanks. We are called to stand out. We find this in the New Testament when we see the teaching of Jesus, his very first sermon when he was speaking publicly. It's recorded in the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins to teach, and then all of a sudden he makes this quick shift, and he says these words to his followers. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now notice in those words, he doesn't say, try to be the salt. Think about being the salt. No, he says, you are the salt of the earth. It's what you are. Now to us, salt is just common. It's super easy to get, right? Go to any fast food restaurant, grab as many of those salt packets you want, shove them in your pocket, walk out the door, and nobody's going to say a word to you. But not so in Jesus' day. No, no. Salt was an incredibly valuable commodity. Salt was difficult to come by. Salt was so powerful, it didn't just flavor food back then. It was the, the, the thing that was used to sustain them. It, they didn't have refrigeration. So if you didn't want your meat to spoil, you salted it. And so you had to have salt to survive. It, it was so valuable that there were times where the Roman soldiers were actually paid their wages in salt. That, that's where that phrase, if you've ever said, not worth your salt, it comes from. Fascinating, I know. Share it at your next cocktail party, okay? Now you know where that came from. See, salt's a powerful thing, right? Just a little bit of salt sprinkled on something, ooh, and the flavor comes alive. Okay, who's with me? Any salt lovers in the house? Go ahead, raise your hand. Okay, got some salt. I love salt. I put salt on my sliced apples. Avocado, slice them up, lay some salt over the top, squeeze a little lime. Oh, you just eat it straight up. Tomatoes, perfect time of year. Big old juicy tomato, sliced up salt on top of it, <gasps> heaven. I even like to crunch up salty potato chips and I put it on my ice cream and eat it. <laughs> hey, don't be snickering at me about that. Trust me, you go to your grocery store, walk down to the freezer aisle, and you go to Blue Bunny. They stole my idea. Sweet and salty pretzel ice cream. I'm telling you, buy it, try it, you'll be hooked. Now, why do I love salt? Do I love it because it makes me swollen, bloated, and high blood pressure? <laughs> no, I love it because it tastes good. I mean, popcorn, for example. Popcorn without salt? Ugh. Anybody here remember the hot air poppers, right? What a waste. <laughs> Thank God for microwave popcorn. Oh, I so. Jesus says to you and I, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Because salt adds flavor. And salt's a preservative. It keeps things from going bad. But then he adds a twist. He adds a but, a very big but. He says, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, from a chemical perspective, you know, table salt, it's sodium chloride, NaCl. It is a really stable compound. It's really difficult to break that compound down into its elemental form. But what you can do is you can taint salt. You can add things to it that make it no longer taste like salt. And Jesus is saying, be careful, because you're salt. But don't lose your saltiness. Because if you do, it's like you become neutral. And you know what that's good for so if you are a Christ follower, you are bringing flavor to this world. 
but we've got a huge problem. Because sometimes we can create ourselves as this Christian subculture that tries to change the world from behind the walls of seclusion. And the taste of that subculture to the unchurched world, well, it is just bad. There was a landmark study done by a group, and they went out and they interviewed thousands and thousands of people who were unchurched non-Christians, and they just asked them to give, them, give back words of first response when they thought of the word Christian. Here was their top five. Hypocritical, judgmental, homophobic, overly political, and out of touch. The authors of this study went on to say that if you introduce yourself as a Christian, you're basically saying to non-Christians, I'm bigoted, hateful, controlling, and I don't like anybody who's different than me. Not the best flavor for the church. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you're thinking, you're nodding, going like, yeah, I, I agree with you, but that's not me. I, I don't preach against things. I don't say judgmental stuff. I, I don't try to exert myself politically. I'm not part of that distasteful subculture. Well, you're thinking that, well, okay, well, good. But I want to ask, what kind of flavor are you adding to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to your community. You see, we've got this trouble with the Christian soul culture that leaves this bitter taste, but what about us who claim to, to personally be Christ followers, but we're not really any different? We're no different than the rest of the world. We're just sort of there, neutral. And when you're neutral or tasteless, well, we know what you're, we're good for. So let's not congratulate ourselves or get all smug about not being offensive because at least the subculture is out there making an impression. So again, I have to ask you, what kind of flavor do you add to your workplace, to your neighborhood? Because if salt loses its flavor, it becomes neutral. Well, if we are called to stand out, if we are ecclesia, the church, the called ones, to call to stand out, to be salty salt, what do we do? That's a great question. The first answer I think that we need to do is this, and that is repent. To acknowledge our misguided direction, to acknowledge our sins, and to turn toward God. 54 times in the New Testament, the word repent or repentance is spoken of. I really appreciate how Luke, the writer of the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he captures the essence of repentance when he gets these words from the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. In Acts 3, it says this, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That was from Peter. From Apostle Paul, it says this, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. What's so powerful about these verses is the descriptive nature that it has of the word repentance. See, so often you and I, we review repentance as just feeling bad. We feel bad about our sin. We feel bad about our mistakes. That's not repentance. That's regret. Not a bad thing, but it's not repentance. If we go to the original language, we find the word for repentance is this, metanoia. Say that after me, metanoia. Metanoia. If you break that root word down into its kind of root basis, what you find is there is this emotional component, similar to regret, that cuts at the heart when we realize that we're heading the wrong direction. But the back end of that word calls us out that there has to be this movement toward action, that we feel and then we change. Because repentance requires change. So if the world has not been experiencing salty salt from us as the church, we first need to repent. So this morning, what I want to do is I just want to go there right now. Let's just pray. Let's just ask that God would redirect us from following ourselves to take action to change to following him. Pray with me. Father God, we come before you as your chosen ones, as the called out ones, as the church. 
And God, we realize there have been times on the things that we do which don't represent you well or represent your bride of Christ, the church. And God, I just come before you today on behalf of us, God, we just ask that you would give us the boldness and the courage to recognize our misguided ways, our sins, and that we would be able to turn and head in a direction towards you. And God, as we follow you and we see Jesus and we follow him on the move, God, we know that there is possibilities and endless potential to change the world around us. But not because of who we are, but because of who you are and that you use us. So we thank you and we lift this up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we first acknowledge our sins. We repent. And we realize that it may be affecting our saltiness. But what do we do to the next level to be the, the called out ones? To stand out. To be salty salt. Well, here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to turn to a person next to you and say, I want to be salty salt. Go ahead. I want to be salty salt. Go ahead. Say it to somebody next to you. All right. So you're asking the question, okay, I want to be salty salt. We're willing, but the question is how? What I'm going to share with you, it is simple and obvious and incredibly difficult to live out every day. Now, for you math whizzes out there, I have a simple equation for you. Salty salt equals love. If we as the church want to stand out and be salty salt, then we've got to get good at love. And I'm not talking about some small, I feel warm and fuzzy inside kind of love. No, no, no. I'm talking about a great, big, God-sized kind of love. And if we want to experience this God-sized kind of love, we got to go to the source. So we're going to dive into our true source, the Bible, this morning, and we're going to unpack what this God-sized love would look like. See, the first thing about this love is it's not only God-sized, it is God-sourced. The apostle Paul, John, who referred to himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved, he, he writes these words in the book of 1 John. He says this, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. He's lavished it on you and I that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So right here we, we read, we are indeed called, and that God, he called us, in love. See, we know that if we are to stand out to be salty, salt to love, that this love, it doesn't originate from us. No, no, no. It comes directly from God. But if we are called out in love, then we are called by God to love. The Apostle Paul, he was a church planting machine throughout the known world during his lifetime. Planted numerous churches that are recorded as letters in the New Testament. To one, of the, to the, one of the churches in Galatia, he writes these words. He says, you, my brothers, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. This past week, my wife Janet was speaking with a young man from a store, and, and he relayed a story to her. He said, I'd sat down with a friend, and his friend had uh, looked across the table at him and said, you know, everybody wants to be a part of your family or have a family like yours. And the young man kind of was taken aback and responded to his friends like, well, you know that our family's not perfect. And his friend replied back to him and says, yeah, I know. But you guys love each other. Hey, I just want to let you know, church, how we love each other, it matters. People are watching. And it's not just people on the outside. It's people here, right in this room today. I know in a room this large, I, knew, I know that online and the different locations that, that are hearing this message, I know there are people that are going to be more impacted by how you and I love each other and watching that than about the music or the teaching or any other element of this morning. How we love each other is indeed going to be for them salty salt. And we have an opportunity, church, to put our love into action outside these walls. Next Saturday, we've got this opportunity with What If the Church Serve Day. And I want to encourage each one of you, part of Westside, to be a part of Serve Day. Now, let me be honest with you. When it comes to What If the Church, Westside, you guys, you play a leadership role, both formally and informally. 
Formerly your very own Matt Adams, he's serving at the kind of the highest level of what at the church. He's the coordinator director of the whole thing. But informally, you, you West Side, you play this role well. Let me just call it the, the big brother role. That you're big brother to many of the churches that are part of what if the church. Churches like Restore. We're watching you guys. We're following you guys. And, and where you lead and how you respond, we will follow. So I just want to encourage you, please lead strongly. And I also want to say to you, thank you for leading strongly. Thank you for being salty salt. Now one more thing about this God-sized love. You and I can and must tap into it. Because this love is unending, it is eternal, it is transformational. Because God himself is love. John, John, the great writer of many books of the New Testament, he wrote these words, which, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to close your eyes. I'm going to read these words, and I want you just to imagine them, that John is writing this letter to you, to you personally. It's recorded in the, the book of 1 John chapter 4. Listen to these words. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love, it comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God himself is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into this world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. You know, if you and I want to be salty salt, if we want to be it as individuals and the church, we must be connected to God. We cannot do this on our own. You can try. You may have experiencing some success for a short period of time, but it's not sustainable without God. And this love we're talking about, it comes to life in each one of us through the power of Jesus. So if you want to be salty salt, you have to know Jesus. You know, what I find fascinating about being salty salt is that the power to be it is also the proof that you are it. It's on both sides of the equation, and that's love. See, love is the power that you and I need if we're going to be salty salt. But also, as Christ followers, the proof, the proof that we actually belong to God is that we become loving. These are the words of Jesus himself when he said, a new command I give to you, and that's love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. And then he says this, by this, by your love, all men, everyone will know that you are my followers, you are my disciples, if you love one another. This past Sunday, uh, after church, my family and I packed up the car and had a family day, and we headed to downtown Kansas City. We grabbed a movie at the Tivoli Theaters in Westport and then down to the plaza for dinner. The, the movie we watched was this independent documentary. It was called I Am. It was a story of Tom Shadyac. Uh, and he had this spiritual awakening that he basically kind of recanted and recounted on this uh, video, this documentary. And, and Tom, he had experienced um, incredible success. He was a Hollywood producer for really popular films like Bruce Almighty, The Nutty Professor, Ace Ventura, and others. And from his success, he'd accumulated tons of wealth and also lots of possessions. We well, had this life-threatening accident that forced him to really ask the big questions that, for, that created this awakening. It wasn't Jesus' focus, but it was profound. Well, as I'm watching this movie, the interesting thing is as it's done, there was just something that absolutely stuck with me from the movie that was completely unexpected. As part of the movie, Tom had interviewed his dad, Richard. 
And his dad, Richard, had worked alongside Danny Thomas to create St. Jude's Hospital back in the 60s. And as he kind of shared his own personal story, he actually just nonchalantly talked about the fact that he had been a regular church attender his whole life. And then he just shared, he said, you know, for 90 minutes every Sunday, I went to the most loving place on earth. And then he proceeded to talk about how that 90 minutes and that amount of love had zero effect on the world around him the rest of the week. You know, I've been here to Westside numerous times, and I'll tell you, this is a loving place. And I'd like to think that Restore is a loving place on Sunday mornings. But I don't want Richard Shadiak's experience to be our experience. That this auditorium could be full of love for four hours, that an auditorium in Park Hill High School or in Shawnee can be filled with love for a few hours on Sunday morning, and then as we leave, it has no effect on us or the world around us. That would not be salty salt. If you and I are going to be salty salt, if we understand that to be love, we're going to have to put feet on it. We got an opportunity. We got an opportunity collectively next weekend to put some feet on it with our serve day. I know that you have lots of choices, but I want to encourage you. Change your calendar. Be a part of it. On next Sunday afternoon, we have another opportunity as the church. We have an opportunity to love outside ourselves and love within ourselves. Be a part of it. But even if you do that one, it can't stop there. If your my love wants to be transformational, we want to be salty salt, we've got to put feet on it 24-7. When you go into your home, you've got to contextualize it. What does it look like for you to be salt in your own home? Where is your salt losing its flavor? With your spouse, with the rest of your family, your parents, your children? What does it look like in your workplace for you to be salty salt? Where are those unloving things that need to change? And how about that drive to work? I know some of you can improve on that one, okay? Be some salty salt on the road. What does that look like? You're going to have to choose and let God speak to you because these are the words of Jesus. A new command I give to you. Love one another. And he says, I have loved you. I've given it to you. You must, not you should or you can, you must love one another. You know why it's so critical? Because by this, all men, everyone, they're just going to know. They're going to know you're my followers. You're my children. Because you love one another. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. And God, we know that you call us to be salt. You tell us we are salt. And we feel very disflavored at times. And God, we feel like we've lost our saltiness. And so we come before you and we ask you, God, to fill us up, to make us salty salt, to make us full of your love, to overflowing. But God, let us not ever think that that is at all possible with us alone. Let us stand before you with open arms and open hearts and say, God, we know that you are the author and perfecter and the giver of love. And we willingly receive it, not so that we can have it, but so that we can share it. As you take us home today, God, let it be salty salt in our cars, in our homes, on the streets and cul-de-sacs where we live, in the workplace that we show up tomorrow, in the schools that you call us to. God, wherever you place us, let us be your disciples who change the world with the gospel and grace of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.